So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm just going to run through four slides here, four basic slides to just kind of give you a background on these uh, three companies. So Sturdy Pro Solutions uh, has created this automated inventory cycle camp module for Sage 500 ERP that automa automates your regular inventory updates. Uh, so we're going to be taking a look at that. Uh, ScanCo is a leader in warehouse management applications for Sage 500 ERP and other Sage applications as well. I've uh, been working with Sage since 1989. Uh, and so has V Technology. So those are two longtime veterans in the Sage 500 market. Uh, v Technologies is a Sage Gold Development Partner, and they specialize in shipping solutions. And they also have very strong relationships with the carriers, and built um, strong applications, shipping-related applications between ERP systems, all the majors out there and uh, the carriers and, and uh, so that, that you can automate your shipment processes and save time and money. So we're going to be talking about the workflow. Uh, the warehouse personnel will do your automated inventory counts. That will go through Sturdy Pro Solutions back into Sage 500 and that goes through ScanCo for automated pick and pack. And then that goes down to Starship to automate your shipment based on all the rules of, uh, that you'd like to follow when shipping goods, um, based you know to get the mo the best rate or to get your shipment there on time. Um, anything that your customer is demanding, uh, Starship can automate those rules so that your business can run more efficiently and get your package off and delivered to your customer. Tracking numbers, everything would be automatically indicated in Sage 500 ERP, all the information related to the shipment. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Sean to start off with the ScanCo. Thanks, Adrian. You're welcome. So, and, and thank you, uh, everybody, for taking the time to join us uh, today. So, uh, as Adrian said, my name is Sean Boros. I am actually one of the owners um, here at ScanCo. And what we do is primarily focus on warehouse management and mobile technology uh, for the Sage ERP market. So, we have a couple of different Sage products that we work with, uh, Sage 500 being one of those, and that today will be uh, – will be our focus. So what we primarily do is take most of the transactions that you're doing on the warehouse floor now manually, maybe with pen and paper, and we put it in the, basically in the hands of a mobile device uh, for the users to do the transactions on the warehouse floor in real time against what is in Sage 500. So if you can think about a purchase order receipt for, for as an example, you, you can actually scan the purchase order number. Everything is validated in real time against that actual purchase order in Sage 500, the items, the quantities, and then everything is sent back to Sage 500 and entered into Sage 500 ERP. So instead of now probably writing everything down that's, that is coming in the door, all of the, the transactions are available uh, from a mobile device so that your guys are actually scanning barcodes and using those devices uh, to, to get that information into Sage 500 in real time. So all of our solutions are completely integrated to the ERPs that we work with. And th this brings some major advantages when you're talking about moving to a mobile device from the warehouse floor. Um, the first of which is being real time against what is in Sage 500. So it's important nowadays when you're looking at moving to a mobile device that the information is available on the device, but that that information is valid and up to date with what is in with what is inside of Sage 500. So all of our transactions, all of the information is pushed in real time to Sage 500 and pulled in real time from Sage 500. So that's that is key when you want that up-to-date information out on the warehouse floor. 
Um, and then with, with a highly integrated solution, there's no integration that needs done. It's all done out of the box. Um, and, there are, and we don't customize Sage 500 in any way, the actual standard Sage 500 ERP. So you install the warehouse automation uh, module from Scanco, and the integration is there, and you're off and running um, using the, the handheld mobile computers out in the warehouse. And then the other good thing when you're talking about using a, an out-of-the-box solution is that our installs are typically less than one week. Um, and, and when you look at implementing a warehouse management package out in the warehouse, there are solutions that, that can get from six months to a year um, implementation time would be a, a couple of hundred thousand dollars uh, to, by the time you do software, hardware, and implementation. So those are, those are the, uh, the things that, that I think are, are unique to Scanco at this point when you're talking about implementing something to better utilize and better manage the warehouse, the personnel um, out on the warehouse floor. So what you're looking at here on my screen is a is a Windows uh, handheld that I'm actually emulating the, the screen uh, so that you guys can, can get an idea of all of the transactions that are available. So within uh, warehouse automation, we can do everything from purchase order receipts to uh, bin transfers, warehouse transfers, um, shipping, RMA returns. We even have some manufacturing transactions if you're, if you're doing uh, material issues, material returns, and so on in the manufacturing side. So. For today, I am actually going to focus more on physical count to go along with CertiPro, and then on the shipping side to go along with Starship. So the, the handheld is actually all touchscreen. I'm actually using a mouse so that you can kind of see um, where I am actually touching on the screen. So I'm going to start by showing you a little bit of the physical count app. So I'm going to go into physical count, and inside of physical count, there are a few different options. You can do a control count, which would be your full-blown annual uh, physical count. You can also do a bin count and, or an item count. Bin and item counts are fantastic when you're talking about moving towards a cycle counting routine, right? So when you're doing an annual physical count, um, you know, it's, it's very time consuming. You've got to write everything down. You've got to count everything. What most of our customers are doing is moving more towards counting a certain bin or counting a certain line of items um, more on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, so that you're keeping that accurate inventory all throughout the year instead of waiting till the end of the year and doing one big adjustment out of inventory. So if you, if you can move to more of a cycle count approach, you're going to find your inventory is more accurate all throughout the year versus at the end. So I'm just going to show you here a quick bin count. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to hit on bin count, and the idea here is that you're going to go up to a bin. Most of our customers will barcode the actual bin location, and so you're going to actually scan the bin first, and then we're going to count only the items and all of the items that are inside of that bin. So this will give you an idea of kind of what the handheld screen looks like. We actually just start at the top and we work our way down, and on the bottom you can see is the entry field. So this is the field that I'm entering in, and all of these fields, of course, we want you to scan a barcode. Um, if you don't have a barcode to scan, you can actually key the, your entry in using the keyboard, or you can do a lookup here. Now, this lookup in all of our transactions are a live lookup to Sage 500. So when I did the lookup, the software went back to Sage 500, and it's bringing me over my physical count batch that I currently have open. So I'm going to hit OK here. And then it's going to want me to scan my bin. So this is where that, that barcode on the bin location comes in really handy is you don't have to key anything in. You don't have to look anything up. You just scan the, the barcode of the bin that you're standing in front of. So I will do a look up here. And these are the bins that are available to count. So I'm just going to choose one here. And of course, if your guys enter a bin that doesn't exist, they're going to be told when they enter the bin that that bin does not exist in Sage 500. As I said, Everything is validated against what is in Sage 500 in real time. So now I'm going to pull the first item out, and I, you can scan that item. You can key in that item. If I do a look up here, what that does is it goes back to Sage, and it grabs the items that are in that bin. So I can click on two-way radio here. Let's, let's say I'm going to count that. It brings up the unit of measure, which is your stocking unit of measure from Sage 500, and then it brings 
the count quantity. Now, this count quantity is not what Sage 500 thinks is in stock. It is actually a running total on the item level of how many have been counted so far. So at no point do you want to tell the user, hey, Sage 500 thinks that you have 50 of these in this bin, or your users will just enter 50 and move on to try and get done in a hurry. So we don't ever show any information to the user about the quantities that Sage 500 thinks is available. So I've scanned my bin, I've scanned my item, and now I can just enter my count quantity, and I'll, I'll hit enter, and I'll loop back up around for the next item. So I can continue counting that item um, in that bin. I can go ahead and do another item here if I find another item in that bin. And again, if, these are, if, if you are using lot numbers or serial numbers, you can see the prompts on the screen. Because of that connection to Sage, when you scan an item, we automatically know if it's lot controlled and we'll prompt you for a lot number. If it's serialized, you'll have to enter a serial number. And if it's neither, you don't have to, to enter either, just because we're checking that valuation on the item level every time you scan an item. So this would be count by bin. Scan bin, scan item, enter quantity. Um, and I, I'll, I will go back here and I'll actually just show you a quick item count. The big difference here is that when you scan, when you enter in to the scan, uh, you're going to scan the item first and then you're going to scan the bin. So it basically just flips those first two prompts around. You're going to scan item, you'll scan bin. So I'm going to pick a batch here. And again, we only have one open. And I'm going to go ahead and scan my item. If I don't have a barcode, I'll go ahead and look it up. I can just pick an item here. And then I've, it's going to want me to scan a bin. So you can kind of see that by bin, you're starting at the bin level and you're working your way down from there. If you start by counting by item, um, you're going to start with scanning the item and you're going to work your way down there. So at this point, you can see that this is a lot of items. So it's going to prompt me to enter a lot number here. So I'm going to back out of here and I'm going to go into sales order here, and we'll do a shipment. So if I go into sales order, the, the idea here is that you've got a sales order. Um, you may be sending a pick list down or the order down to the warehouse floor. Guys are probably walking around. They're manually um, just kind of recording on maybe that pick list of what they're actually picking and shipping, and then that's going back to the office for somebody to manually enter in. Um, at that point. So again, the idea here is that you're going to use a mobile device um, out in the warehouse versus writing everything down. So if I go into sales order here, you've got three main ways to do your picking. If, you've, if you pick by pick list, you would use the pick list app. If you pick by order, you would go ahead and pick by order. Or if you've generated that shipment already, you could go in and you can actually pick using the shipment number. So for today's demonstration, I'm just going to pick by order here real quick. And it's just like purchase order or any other application here. Everything is validated as you're scanning it. So you're going to scan the sales order number, and it's going to validate that that's an actual order within Sage 500 at the point that that order is scanned. Um, if it's not an order, your user will be prompted at that point that that order doesn't exist, and they'll have to scan the correct order number. So I'll just go in here and pick an order here. And what most of our customers do is just add a barcode to the actual pick list or to the sales order that goes down to the warehouse floor. And that barcode would represent the pick list number, or the shipment number, or the order number. So that is what you would scan to kind of get in to the actual sales order itself. So now you would walk over to your first item. You're going to go ahead and pick your first item here. And again, if you scan an item that isn't on the order, it's going to come up with a message that this item isn't on this order. So I did a, a look up here, and you can see that there are five or four line items on this order. I'm going to go ahead and just pick the third one here. And it's going to tell me that that's line two on the order. My unit of measure, and this is sales unit of measure, is in eaches. So I sold it in eaches. That's going to want me to ship in eaches. And then I need to scan my bin number. So you would scan the barcode on the bin that you're pulling it from. If not, you could do another look up here. And the nice thing about the lookup is it gives you the bin ID, but it also gives you the quantity available in each bin. So it's not going to let you ship something that isn't there. So that quantity available is, is nice to have. So you can see I've got 164 available in this bin. Uh, the quantity on the order that needs picked is 10. 
I've picked zero so far. So I can go ahead and enter my 10, hit enter here, and it's just going to loop back up around for the next item. So I, I would keep going here and just keep picking until um, I'm done with this order. And you can see as I finish a line item, if I do a look up here, that line item is no longer there. So now I've got three lines that, three more lines that need picked. So again, the idea here is you're going to validate the sales order, you're going to validate the items, you're going to validate the quantities to pick. So if you're misshipping, maybe your guys are pulling the wrong item numbers, maybe they're shipping the wrong quantities, all of this happens in real time so that the guys on the warehouse floor are aware of any mistakes that they've made before, as they're picking versus when your customer receives an order and ultimately calls you and lets you know that maybe you shipped something wrong. Um, on the physical count time, just the general rule of barcoding on time savings is you can expect to save about 75 to 80 percent of your total count time by using a barcoding solution. And that is not specific to Scanco. It's just barcoding in general. So if you can look at the time that it takes for you to, from when you freeze inventory, you go out, you write everything down, you send that to the warehouse, somebody or to the front office, somebody's got to type all that stuff in. Using barcoding in general will save you 75 to 80 percent of that time. So I am going to pass over to Andy at this point, um, who's going to run you through some of the options that Serta Pro has on uh, on the Sage 500 count side. Thank you, Sean. It was a great presentation. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, for the presentation. Uh, here, Sean was showing you the physical inventory count process uh, when um, the physical batch is already generated in the system. He was pulling the batch number eight. As you've seen, then he can do counts using the by bin or by item. So now we're going to try to answer the question as far as how do we automate and generate that batch on a daily basis? And how do we program inside Sage 500 to as far as what items that you need to count on daily basis and it does every day and in the schedule, it automates the email notification to the certain people that here are the items that you need to count. So we'll be, we're going to be answering to those questions today with this presentation. Uh, we have created this program called uh, Inventory Cycle Count Planner and it runs from the menu. Uh, first, I would like to mention that this program has been developed uh, inside for Sage 500. Uh, it is not modifying any existing program. What it does, it pulls the data from Sage tables uh, as far as the inventory part goes, and it creates at the end of the day a uh, physical count, uh, phys a physical count entry program. It freezes the items. So if you have any customization, uh, this could be installed without any problem. It's not, it's not overriding any existing program. Uh, so here I'm going to be selecting the warehouse. As I select the warehouse, it pulls the data into my uh, little grid in the middle that it shows me how many inventory items I have in this uh, Rialto warehouse. Uh, I have a couple of options of the filtering. I can filter by the finished goods, assembled kit, and also the raw materials. So technically I can have uh, two separate schedules for one warehouse to do cycle counts. So let's say there's a team who will be focusing on the raw materials, then there will be a team who's focusing for the finished goods and raw materials, assembled kits. You can separate them and create a separate uh, a cycle count uh, program. Uh, as you select the item, the inventory gets loaded into this middle grid. Uh, this middle grid is like, uh, works like an Excel file. You can put your filters in here and it will filter down to the item. The goal of this program mainly is to tell the system how many times throughout the year you would like to count the item and uh, based on that the system will generate daily counts and will send an email notification. So for me to filter I can start typing an item. I can filter by the item. starts with automatically as I type in it brings the items. And as you see, like every first time that as soon as I entered my Rialto warehouse, it loads the data. We have the we have the 
once a field called YCC, Yearly Cycle Count Code. All this information right now is set to be minus one. So when you implement the system, all of your inventory items will be flagged as minus one. That means that those items are not participating into a uh, cycle count program. As we go through the process, we can update them to any interval that we would like to. Uh, and we can also set to zero. Zero has a special meaning that uh, you go to your inventory and you decide that there are items that you never want to count and you can flag them to be zero. Uh, oh, these are the update features that are on the top. I will show you now how to update the items. And uh, on the bottom portion of that uh, of the screen, we can designate and put the email addresses of the people who are going to be notified when this program runs. Uh, you can schedule the program to run on a daily basis. There is a scheduler that will open up now, and this will allow us to uh, create a schedule on that SQL server which the job will run at any time you would like to. We usually do 2 a.m. It will run on the back end. It will generate the physical count program, and it will send the email to the designated people who are responsible for the count. So now I'm going to use the cost uh, of the items and assign all of my 100 items into the cycle counts uh, program interval. So like I can go quickly. The grid is uh, pretty flexible, as I've shown you. It's working as a filter. You can also go and say, OK, I would like to see only the minus ones in my case. And I'm going to filter by the unit cost. And I can highlight the items. like Just like in the Excel file, you scroll down by the arrow down. And I select all the items up to $1,500. And I assign them to be counted four times a year. As I go assign the items to the four times a year, it moves the 10 items from my list and puts into this category. It's telling me that I have uh, items that I'm going to be counting four times a year. So using the same uh, schema, I can go and continue assigning the items from uh, now up to $200. Uh, using the cost, obviously, you can use the uh, the cost of goods sold, gross margin, heat, the quantity sold field that are available. So for this demonstration, I'm using the cost, uh, average cost field. So now I'm going to say that all these items are going to be counted uh, three times a year. And uh, I'm going to continue in my list. I'm going to say all the items up to $50 I need to count two times a year. And then the rest of the items I'm going to count uh, once a year, $50 and less. So instead of clicking on uh, moving my arrow down and highlighting the items, I can click also on the corner of the grid. It will select the entire grid for me. And I can just go in here and say, OK, I would like to count these items once a year. So as, you, as you've seen, like in within a Five ten minutes. I went through using the cost, and I categorized all my all of my items through the cycle counts to be counted four times a year, three times a year, two times a year, and once a year. Uh, you could use all the fields that are available here in the grid for that purpose. Uh, as you as you see here, there are a couple of other there are a couple of other fields that I would like to talk about. Uh, one of them are called force count next time. So if I select one or two items and I highlight force count next time, it will flag the item to be counted on the next morning. So this is a helpful feature in terms when you know that there is a discrepancy in the, for this item and you do not want to wait until the end of uh, until the time for this item to be counted and uh, you want to resolve that problem now. So you can push this button, and next morning, this item will end up into your cycle count. Uh, the same way you can undo your force count. Let's say you set up the item. You can reverse that as needed.
Um, the other option is hold. Let's say that uh, there are some items that you are having a problem with and you do not want to do cycle counts for those items. You can go ahead and put the items on hold and they will not show up on your uh, cycle count program. And uh, uh, we have some other options as well. Uh, if you would like permanently to stop a cycle count for whatever reason, then the status here is active. You can switch it to inactive. And as a result, it will stop sending out the emails to the people to count the item. It will stop generating the physical count entry program. Uh, the same way, we also have exception days where you can go and program the days that are holidays or vacations. And uh, this way, when the time comes in, it will not generate, uh, it will skip those days, it will not generate any uh, uh, physical count for, for the users. Uh, some options that are here are also available for us. Uh, when it creates a batch, we can say to set count quantity to be the same as for a freeze quantity. This is an option, you can turn it on and off. Uh, when it generates the count, you can tell the system where to include the zero on hand uh, items. So let's say that it's time for us to, co to count the uh, gateway item that I'm highlighting here. And that item has only, uh, that item has zero quantity on hand. Do you want the system to continue pushing this item into the count sheet or no? The other option is rollover YCC count from large to small. So in my example where I have uh, four different categories. I have only 10 items I'm going to need to count four times a year. And we're telling the system, if I'm done with these items, which I'll be done in 10 days, do you want the system to go and pull an extra item from the other count and that way to maintain the number of items that needs to be counted each day? As, as a result, right now, I have four items that I'm going to be counted each day throughout every day. And uh, if we do this, then uh, it will maintain uh, that number of items that you need to count. So this is helpful when you are done with counting the most expensive items throughout the year many times. And then uh, you just want your warehouse people not to be uh, idle. They can just go and to count uh, some other items on time, uh, on uh, more items to be counted uh, versus uh, less. Uh, so right now, uh, obviously, that the schedule is set up to be running at 12 a.m. We also have an option here to say generate the batch. So if I push this button, generate the batch, it's going to go and do the following. It will go create the batch uh, for us inside the physical count entry program. So um, then we can go to the standard program. So now if we go to uh, Process Physical Inventory screen, there is a batch that just got created uh, as a result of the button that I pushed. You would not normally push that button. This is uh, mainly for testing purposes and also like on demand if you would like to create a physical count, uh, invent, uh, physical process physical inventory uh, screen. Uh, that's an option there, but in reality, the program runs uh, in the background. Uh, you can set it up the time by schedule. So as you see now, that if I go now to the enter count, the items that are going to be there are, are here. It will show by the bin location because MOS 500 supports multi-bin. For all the items that uh, I have selected, it pushes into this program. So at this point, if you're using the scanner solution that Sean was showing, what you need to do is select the batch number 20, and you will have the items into your handheld, and you can do the counts and verifying the information. So this is, a, this is all great when you generate the cycle count, and uh, the goal of this, obviously, to eliminate the end of the year uh, expensive physical count process. But I would like to point out that we also have a, an audit log kind of a, a data uh, tool that you can, we, we developed that you can see throughout the year how many times each item has been counted, whether there was a discrepancy or not. 
we will lo we are logging all that information and we're showing into this uh, explorer view so here you can put the time time uh, uh, you can put the the date uh, as your filter by post date for example to see from the period 4 to period 6 how many items I counted and on the bottom it tells me the number of items that has been counted I can quickly drag and drop the items into here and I can see how many times each item has been counted and if I want to drill down into those items I could see that this items has been counted in two different days and there is no uh, discrepancy happened uh, if there are any items that have discrepancies that you could see that there's a unit cost and the transaction amount if I click on that I could see where the discrepancy happened on the bottom of the screen as far as what bean and what uh, the lot number or what serial number has been uh, has that issue when you did the count so we are giving the full visibility throughout the, uh, from the time you start implementing the system uh, to the end uh, of uh, the end of the year you can run the report and see all the information that you need um, from from the system um, to implement the system you really don't need to wait until the end of the year or wait until the month end uh, as soon as it gets installed you go categorize the items into different categories per your uh, requirement then it's ready to go uh, so this is it for t today. I'm going to be passing to Caroline to continue the demonstration. Thank you so much for your time. Hey guys, it's Caroline from V Technologies. Um, going to be showing you the Starship shipping solution today, integrated to Sage 500. Um, Starship's a multi-carrier shipping application that connects to both parcel and LTL carriers. Um, we have direct connections to the carriers so that we can access your um, most accurate negotiated rates at the time of shipment, um, process the um, shipping labels, and then update Sage 500 in real time. Similar to what Sean mentioned, and also Andy actually over at um, the Certipro solution, you know, Starship doesn't modify the Sage 500 um, solution in any way. Um, we are basically just giving you access to the data. Um, reading it and then updating it. So I'm going to process a Sage 500 shipment, and if you if you were using the Scanco solution to do the pick and pack on the handheld, um, that would or could update the shipment information, and then Starship could pull from that. So you can have the shipment number barcoded um, and scan that in, and Starship will pull the shipping information for the shipment. Um, it's going to translate the ship via, bring over the recipient or the ship to information. Um, it does address validation, zip plus four residential commercial on domestic addresses. Um, this happens to be an international shipment to Canada. Um, so I'll show you a couple things that are related to that in a second here. Um, let's expand my um, packages. So down here in the packaging view, you'll see that Starship brought in all of the packages that were associated to the shipment. So if you use the scan code solution to define the items in the box, you would then um, you know, be able to see what was scanned in through the Starship UI here. So you're going to see in this box number 28, I have these adapters. And if I drill into the item here for these adapters, um, you'll see that there's some international data associated to it. This is basically um, going to enable you to either pull like the um, international specific data like Schedule B codes or harmonized codes, um, or you can also store this information in Starship's database, and Starship will pull as much information in it as we can from 500, and then we'll pull in all the additional shipping-related detail about the item. I can also do a rate shop here if I wanted to. Um, Starship's going to go out to the individual carriers that I have loaded here and um, request a rate for this particular shipment. And in this case, you'll see I have a combination of both parcel and LTL carriers here. So you can have Starship rate across those if you'd like to um, see if possibly going an LTL carrier might be less expensive 
than um, using maybe a 100 weight going UPS or something of that nature. Starship also has something called ship via rules where you can define parameters on how and when the carrier and service should be selected. So if you wanted to use a needs by date and select the least expensive way to ship this shipment out, um, you know, to get it there by a certain time, Starship can automatically do a selection for you so that the shipper doesn't have to manually, you know, do a rate shop and run this. In this case, you'll see um, my carrier and services that are available for the shipment. Um, you'll also see a little um, informational message here. So if I drill into any of these, you can see the details that make up this uh, particular uh, freight charge here. So there's the freight charge, fuel surcharge, residential delivery surcharge. And maybe in this case, um, this international priority shipment is 551. Maybe I want to go UPS standard to Canada. It'll get there in, um, it'll take one extra day to get there, but it's only 100 bucks. So I'm going to go ahead and pick that. So at any point, you can change the um, carrier and service selection. Um, this is also something that um, you can, you know, provide permissions for um, for the particular shipper. So if you don't want your shippers selecting the carrier and service you um, can set their permission level so that they don't have access to modify what was either translated from the ship via or the carrier and service that was um, selected based on your rules. And now all I really have to do is um, process the shipment. So if I um, process the shipment, Starship will generate the barcoded shipping labels. This happens to be what we call our smart label. It's the packing list plus the shipping label on 8.5 by 11. And the shipping label would be on a die cut area where it would peel off. Um, Starship can also support printing uh, to the thermal labels uh, or thermal label printers. So if you, um, you know, wanted to print this regular um, shipping label out and then have the packing list follow it on the thermal label printer, you could do that. And then Starship would print two um, four by six, seven or eight inch labels for every package that you had. Again, on this packing list, you're going to see the um, item information, the quantity ordered and the quantity shipped. And again, if you're using ScanCo, that's all automated, so you don't have to um, manually select anything in Starship. This particular shipment had six boxes, so I'm just going to go through my labels here. And I'm having the label print um, on screen, so you can actually see it, but typically, these would just print directly to the printer, um, and then you would go and um, stick those on the packages. And because this was an international shipment, Starship's also generating the commercial invoice for you. And it's going to put basically the header level information is in the top quadrant of the um, report. And then item level information is used um, here in the body of the report. Uh, commercial invoice um, and NAFTA shipper's letter of instruction. There are several other international forms that um, come standard as templates in Starship. You do have the ability to modify templates in Starship if you wanted them to look slightly different. Um, also, uh, the commercial invoice in some for some countries they require uh, to print the commercial invoice on letterhead. So you do have the ability to import your logo and um, you know, make it print on something that looks more like letterhead. So once I've processed the shipment, uh, Starship's going to update the Sage 500 document in real time. Let me just go in and show you what that looks like. Um, and before I go in there, just to note, um, Starship also has email notification, so it can generate an email at the time of shipment. The email can include both the header and item level information. Um, it can include variable fields from Sage 500. So if you want to reference a PO number for your customer, you can do that. You can define separate templates and then define rules on when those templates are used. So if you would like your emails to look differently, um, maybe you're drop shipping and you um, are basing it on the sender or something of that nature, you can, you can create rules around that. So I'm just going to go in Sage 500. Um, I'm going to run Enter Pack List here, and I'm going to bring up that 700 
32 shipment. So this is the shipment that we just processed. Um, and you'll notice there's a couple things that Starship updated. Um, we're updating the freight charges. Now the freight charges can include customizable handling fees. Um, Starship has something called freight rules where you can um, define how and when it gets updated. And those rules can again um, include parameters based on 500 fields. So if you wanted to provide free freight for shipments that are over $500, you could create a rule like that or you could base it on customer type. It's another popular field that's used in freight rules. So my um, here's package one of six, tracking information, freight charges, um, the ship via that was um, actually used here. And it gets updated um, the same way for all six packages here. So the different tracking numbers would be updated. Um, I think that's really all I had on the Starship side, so I'm going to send it back to Adrian. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks, Adrian. And then I'm going to go ahead and mute, mute you, Caroline, until we have a question for you. I think okay. I, that's going to echo with my side over here. Okay, so uh, what we'll do now is I'm going to show some contact information of all of the speakers. Uh, so you can see Andy's contact information, Sean's contact information, and Caroline's contact information. Um, please reach out to them with any questions.